We continue today in the sermon series on Jesus. And I need to say that uh, I have dedicated this sermon today to Marilyn Potts on her 90th birthday. She is not with us, she's out celebrating. Uh, to Jane Carter on her 90th birthday, and to my friend and our member, Jill Jeffrey Kingsley. It's good to have you here from California right now, Jill. But she is the last grandchild, last living grandchild, of Celia and Joseph Jeffrey. And the series, as you know, or will soon know, is based on the Jeffrey window. So Jill, it warms my heart to have you with us and to um, dedicate this to you. And in Thanksgiving, I said on Ash Wednesday, the beautiful story about this window is that your family, that your grandparents, that's so close it feels, your grandparents gave the money that got us started, made this building of this Cathedral of Grace possible. And in thanks, Jill, the church named the window for your family, which I think is such a great statement of grace and love, which work well with all we're about to hear next. So let us join together and thank you. It's good to be with all of you, but particularly welcome to you today. Would you join me in prayer? May the words of my mouth and the meditations of each one of our hearts be acceptable in your sight, O Lord, our rock and our salvation. Amen. A young woman interviewing a colleague of mine for a newspaper, or for, excuse me, for a college paper she was writing on world religions, came with a list of questions. After going through all the questions like, how does your denomination understand God? And who is Jesus to you? And does your church believe in heaven and hell? The young student came to her final question. What is the central message of your faith? He answered each question as best he could, but found himself lingering on the final question. It was a question that stayed with him long after she had gone. In fact, it never left him. He couldn't shake it. It has always held on to him. What is the central message of our faith? He found that the central message of his faith, our faith, was found here in the first chapter of the Gospel of Mark. Perhaps the best answer is found, again, for all of us as well today. Still dripping wet from his baptism in the Jordan River with John, his cousin, Jesus is driven into the wilderness by the same Spirit who was just present with him at his baptism. There he is tempted by Satan with wild beasts and angels attending to him. This is all Mark gives us. Mark likes to be short and brief and clip out a lot of the details. While Luke and Matthew spell out the temptations in great detail, as are seen on the front cover of your bulletin today, from the panel of the Jeffrey window, you can see how temptation de develops in the picture in the window because that's the one we keep with us. So let me salt and pepper the story for Mark today with a little bit of Matthew and Luke thrown in. To begin his mission, Jesus has a showdown for 40 days with Satan in the wilderness. Through Satan's temptations, Jesus is confronted by his, Jesus, excuse me, Jesus confronts his own worst demons there in the desert. As Satan asks him to turn stones into bread, to offer him the kingdoms of the world if Jesus will just worship him, and then challenges Jesus to jump from the top of the temple to prove that God will catch him and save him. Satan challenges Jesus to act like God, he challenges him to demonstrate God's power over the world and over life and death, and he tempts him to be a dazzler. But this is not the mission of Jesus. Jesus was not a devil dazzler. Martin Luther wrote this on this passage. Throughout his life, Jesus conducted himself so humbly and associated with sinful men and women and as a consequence was not held in great esteem, on account of which the devil overlooked him. 
and he did not recognize him. For the devil is far-sighted. He looks for what is big and high and attaches himself to that. He does not look at what is low and beneath him. Therefore, he never really saw Jesus. I love that. Thank you, Martin Luther. Therefore, he never really saw Jesus. See, the devil doesn't see Jesus because Jesus is not in his eyesight. He's down with people where they're hurting. Rather than worrying about dazzling the devil, now wet with sweat and famished from 40 days of fasting, Jesus exits the desert and speaks his first words of public ministry. He says through his dry lips and famished body, repent and believe in the gospel. God has been unleashed and is now loose in the person of Jesus. In these words of Jesus, there is no distant hope, no otherworldly predictions and proclamations. He's not so heavenly bound that he's no earthly good. There are things that are going to change right now. So let's, let's brace ourselves for what's coming now. This is the central message of our faith. It's right here, repentance, but better known, better called, Metanoia, which is really the, the root of the word. Metanoia is everything. Metanoia is a word that is shouted, not whispered, by John and Jesus, although what happens in its path can come from the whisper of God in your ear, the touch of God on your heart. It is a word full of meaning, a word that takes us to the central message of our faith. It has two primary meanings. In the Hebrew Scriptures, Metanoia means to turn or to return. It directly relates to ancient, exiles, uh, ancient Israel's exile in Babylon and their return home, God calling them home to their homeland. It literally means to embark on a journey of return to the homeland, to the Holy Land, where God is found. But you are not only traveling to the place where God is found as the people of old, you're traveling with God on the return. The entire journey is metanoia. But there's a second meaning, and it comes alive in the Christian scriptures beginning in Mark 1, 14 and 15. It means to go beyond the mind we have, to go beyond the mind we have. This phrase is both evocative and provocative. The mind we have is acquired from socialization experiences in time with people in places of race, of gender, of gender identity and orientation, and so much more. The mind we have is enculturated in ways that we have been shaped across a lifetime by people who have shaped our thinking and our actions. To go beyond the mind you have means to see and act in a whole new way a way shaped by God, known decisively in Jesus. And this is what repentance is. Although the Bible speaks of repenting of our sins, the emphasis throughout scriptures is not so much on contrition and sorrow and guilt, it is on turning and returning to God, returning from what was and turning back to God. Repentance is about change, writes Marcus Borg. It is not primarily a prerequisite for forgiveness. While that may shock some of you, it is the truth. Now, I like to say that when a congregational UCC pastor stands in the pulpit and says, it is the truth, you all go, what? We have lots of truths. We follow a lot of different ways. But repentance is actually what it's about. Is it about returning? It is about turning around. It is about a new mindset. It is about change. It is not, in Marcus's words, simply a prerequisite for forgiveness. And what is the new way the gospel is calling us to? What do we see when we turn around? Here it is. What comes from the basis of our faith? We see love. We see the face of God. And the face of God is love. Love. If it's not love, then it's not God. 
It is love that calls Jesus to the waters of baptism in the Jordan River with John. Yes, he's loved him as long as he's known him all his life as his cousin. It is love that comes from the voice of God. You are my son whom I love. It is love that pushes the Holy Spirit to push Jesus out of the water and into the wilderness. And it is love that battles evil in the presence of Satan. It is love that gathers the wild beasts to stand by Jesus' side during the trying times in the wilderness. And it is love that gathers the angels and their love offers protection for Jesus. It is love that Jesus is calling us to turn around to see, to feel, to experience, to share. It is love that fuels the gospel of Jesus Christ. That's it. Love is the central message of our faith. And we get to love through metanoia, through turning around, through returning to God, through going beyond the mind that we have. I believe love is everywhere. If we only have the perception to see it and to feel it, for example, in Genesis 9, 8 through 17, as Bill read to us, God places the bow in the sky as a reminder of the covenant with God's people. The rainbow sign is a sign of God's love for humanity. Walter Brueggemann writes it this way, the bow is likely not understood in romantic ways, nor with an accent of political pluralism. Rather, the bow refers to God's bow and arrows as weapons of war, hostility, and destructiveness. But God moves the bow from one place on earth to another. God suspends the bow in the heavens as a gesture of disarmament, as a promise not to be the aggressor or the adversary of humanity. It is God's gesture of love, of peace and reconciliation. God intends to be at peace with God's world, recalcitrant though it has been. The bow is not a message for humanity, he, he finishes. He says, it is a reminder to God to be faithful and everlasting as God has promised to be. So the rainbow is actually like God's tablet note in the sky. You know, God says a note to God's self that says, hey God, remember today to love them in spite of all the evidence you have not to. The bow constantly reminds God to remember to be loving to the people who are always forgetting to be loving to the people. In 1 Peter, we hear as well Peter's reminder to us as followers of Christ to love as completely as he first loved us. Against the opposition of a hostile culture, Jesus walked into Jerusalem. This is so important. He entered Jerusalem with nothing, nothing but the shirt on his back, and the sandals on his feet. He had nothing against all the hostile people that he met as he crossed the threshold of the city. He entered only with this, gentleness and kindness, reverence and love that he laid down for us in giving his life for the world. In total and complete sacrificial love, a love which overcame principalities and powers, he died and was laid in a tomb, was, was risen and ascended into heaven, and lives with the angels and the power of God to love eternally for all time. Peter reminds us in his letter to always maintain a hopeful view of the world in spite of all of the evidence to give up, to turn it in and say it's not worth it anymore. Isn't that essentially what true love looks like? Love perseveres when all else and all other evidence points to giving up and simply laying down and dying. Love lifts us up when there is no logical reason to be raised up. Returning to Mark, we are reminded of love in the wilderness. And I love this, literally. While Matthew and Luke's Gospels are telling us of the complicated stories of Satan's temptations of Jesus in the wilderness, what does Mark do? He's interested in the wildness of the wilderness not the temptations. Mark is focused on the wild work of Jesus and the wild beasts and the wild angels that attend to him there. If you were in the wilderness and you knew that the wolves were there to protect you and the bears were your friends 
and the wildebeests and the scorpions were right by your side to watch out for the devil? If you were in the wilderness and knew that the rattlesnake had your back and the coyote was on your shoulder, you could face anything. If you knew the wild beasts were yours and with you, you could face it all. You could face the heat and the cold. You could take on any spiritual and physical hardship knowing that the beasts are ministering to me. They got my back and my front. And then, when the beasts were resting from the scorching noonday sun, you knew that God sent the spiritual heavy artillery of angels to your shoulder, giving you cover from the oppression and temptations of the wilderness heat. You could muster all the courage there and be strong in the face of that to face the devil, and no matter what he put in front of you, you could do it because your path was clear by the wild beasts and the angels. Just like Jesus, you could say, be gone, Satan. It would just roll off your lips. And that's what he came to say over and over and over again. And I often think he just said it like that. Be gone, Satan. God of love, who sends us the bow as a reminder of God's self to keep peace with people who destroy life with callous disregard. The God of love, who sends wild beasts and wild angels to protect and defend his beloved son in the wilderness. The God of love who gives us a savior who is gentle and kind and just and compassionate and loving, who loves us so much that he'd lay down his life for us. That's a God we can trust. That's a God we can follow. You see how love is the central message of our faith? And we get to love through metanoia, through turning around, through returning to God, through going beyond the mind that we have. The central message of our faith is love. I pray this week that the wild beasts will minister to you even though they may appear to be your pets. They're still kind of wild inside. <laughs> I pray that the angels of God will be on your shoulder this week knocking down all the lovelessness that comes at you from behind and in front, even as they appear in human form. And may our God of love, love and care for you in ways that you never saw before <coughs> and you never imagined possible.